Good evening and welcome to q and I'm Tony Jones and here to answer your questions tonight, political editor at The Guardian Australia, Lenore Taylor, incoming Minister for Trade and Investment, Steve Chobo, rising Labor MP, Terry Butler, conservative commentator and best-selling author of A Disgrace to the Profession, Mark Stein, and Greens Senator Sarah Hanson-Young. So please welcome our panel. Well, as you may have noticed, newly elected Deputy Prime Minister Barnaby Joyce can't be with us tonight. He's gone back to where he came from, Queensland. So we'll look forward to seeing him again on Q&A soon. Uh, you can join the Twitter conversation by uh, watching Q&A live on ABC TV. And if you live in Queensland, South Australia, the Northern Territory or Western Australia, it's simulcast on ABC News 24. And you can listen live across Australia on News Radio. Well, our first question tonight comes from Emily Kemp. Are the polls an indication that the public does not like the direction that Malcolm Turnbull is taking with regard to issues such as tax reform? Or is it a reflection of the perception that our new Prime Minister is a man of words and not action? We'll go around the whole panel on this. First, Lenore Taylor. Uh, I think the polls are an indication that the public hasn't really figured out what Malcolm Turnbull is about yet. There was a central contradiction in his ascent to power. On the one hand, he promised the, the party, his colleagues, that he'd be basically the same as Tony Abbott, not much different at all. But the public were led to believe that he'd be quite a lot different. Now, he's taken his time to figure out what policies he'll change and which ones he'll leave the same. He's had a bit of a mess on tax reform recently, but we're assured that'll all be cleaned up by the budget. And I think people are suspending judgment, if you like. A bit of the gloss has worn off and they're just waiting to see what he delivers. But to my mind, that essential schism, that conundrum from the start is still an unanswered question. So very briefly, to what degree does Malcolm Turnbull personally have to take responsibility for this slump in the polls? Well, he's the one providing, providing direction to the new government and basically since last September, not much different has changed and we haven't got much clarity about what the new direction is. So, yeah, he has to take responsibility. Steve Chobo, you've changed. Uh, <laughs> you're, not <laughs> you're, not, you're not pinning it on me, are you, Tony? No, no, you, you're I, part um, of the new breed. So. Well, look, I mean, I, in terms of the polls, and I know this sounds like a cliche, but I always say... In politics, polls go up, polls go down, because they do. Um, this notion that there's a gloss that applies to you know, a particular leader or a particular member of the government or the opposition, for that matter, um, you know, we don't get too caught up in it. But the difference, I think, to the situation with Tony Abbott, for me as a Queensland MP, I think we saw it most poignantly uh, with Campbell Newman. I mean, the electorate was saying something in Queensland for a long period of time. Uh, and nothing happened with respect to Campbell Newman. And then we saw the results... Well, the electorate was more well, or less saying, we don't like Campbell Newman. Well, that's what I'm saying. And then we saw the Were results of the election. saying that about Tony Abbott? Well, I think the electorate was saying that about Tony Abbott. I mean, I, think, I do think that's the message that, that we got, and ultimately that's why the parliamentary party responded to that message. So... It's all about know, who you like the most. No, it's not about that, but it's about your effectiveness as a leader. I mean, if you're going to be a political leader, whether you're the Prime Minister of the country or the opposition leader... You've got to take the people with you. That is that is core business for anybody in politics. But perhaps the problem was the policies. Mm. Well, but it's it's all these things. I mean, it's not just... You, you can't cleave policies. I mean, you're asking me, well, how do I apportion a percentage to policies? How do I apportion a percentage uh, to the personality? How do I proportion a, a, centage, a percentage to the salesmanship, for lack of a better term? I mean, it's a combination of all of these things. OK, let's move around. Terry Butler. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, for me, I think that what it shows is probably that people are starting to see Malcolm Turnbull as someone who says one thing and does another. And for me, the classic is marriage equality, of course. In August last year, he was saying that we needed to have a free vote on marriage equality. He became Prime Minister about a month later. And what have we seen? No movement on having a free vote on marriage equality because he says one thing, he does another. And I think that's unfortunate. And I think that people are really disappointed in that. I mean, say what you like about Tony Abbott. Tony Abbott is someone who always stuck to his values, crazy as those values may have been from time to time. <laughs> He's someone who always stuck to them. I think Malcolm Turnbull is someone who will uh, happily sell his principles out, and that's what we've seen already. Mark Stein, what do you think? How does this look um, from a distance? I know well, you were, as a, as a Conservative, you were quite... Uh, as, well, you were a supporter of, uh, of Tony Abbott. Yeah, yeah Tony uh, was more congenial to me than... Uh, his usurper, but uh, Lenore, <laughs> Len, Lenore, I thought put it put it very well. Um, you know, he came to power because of the bad polls, because there'd been like uh, 137 lousy polls for Tony Abbott. 
So he, he staged his coup. If the polls head south for Malcolm Turnbull, uh, that, that destroys the rationale for his prime ministership. And uh, Lenore also said that, in, in a sense, he got away with the coup by promising not to change very much at all. Um, I, don't, I don't know Malcolm Turnbull very well. I'm very interested in demography. And you, you know he walked out on a speech of yours. I yeah, did he, read that. Uh, yeah, he walked out on a speech of mine, but actually during the introduction, he never heard a word of me. He was, <laughs> <laughs> it was Nick Minchin, the former uh, Senate leader, who uh, offended Malcolm in the introduction. It must have been a great introduction. It was, I know, it was a hell of an introduction, and Malcolm was sitting across the table and uh, uh, flounced off in a big queenie huff for one so Republican. <laughs> Um, but uh, he, he has big ideas on things like demography, uh, even on the, you know, the Republic or whatever. He's a big ideas guy. But, but the deal was that nothing would change except his face where Tony Abbott's face used to be. And I think he's caught in a trap of his own making there. If, if the poll numbers reach Tony Abbott levels, what was the point of the switch? You're in, you're in Kevin and Julia territory. Though. Right now, they're not headed south. They're headed sort of south-southwest. Yeah, uh, yeah. So uh, we'll have to wait and see. Sarah Hanson-Young. Well, I didn't think that I'd agree with Mark so early in the piece, actually. <laughs> um, the, you know, like many people, when Malcolm Turnbull took over the leadership, I guess I felt quite hopeful. Tony Abbott was gone. Um, that was great. You know, worst prime minister we've ever had. Greg Hunt got the Best Minister of the, the World Award. I reckon Tony <laughs> Abbott would get the Worst Prime Minister of the World Award. Um, but there's a lot of goodwill that came with that, a lot of goodwill from people across all uh, demographics, all parties, that we wanted to see change. We wanted to see vision and courage. And I don't know, uh, some people say the jury's out. Some are uh, saying that perhaps some of the gloss is wearing off. Um, I just don't think that goodwill lasts forever. People want to see a change. And Lenore is right. It's not just about the salesman. It actually is fundamentally about the policies. The, the budget that was handed down in 2014 did immense damage uh, to the coalition and they still haven't recovered from it yet. When it comes to those key issues of equality, um, they really have to start being upfront with the Australian people about what kind of community, what kind of services um, they're prepared to back. Um, we'll move straight to our next question because it's also on the subjects from Nishtar Shetty. What is the Liberal Party's take on the Labor's call for um, a police investigation of Stuart Robert? Uh, is the reshuffle just a means to quell opposition and decrease uh, and address the decreasing popularity of Malcolm Turnbull? Steve Chobert. Uh, well, a couple of things. Um, I think that the reason why the Labor Party uh, has said that they want to see a police inquiry is because they're operating on the principle of throw enough mud and hope some of it sticks. Um, and the reason why I say that is because Mark Dreyfus happened to use the Premier ABC radio platform to announce that they wanted a police investigation. So, you know, politics doesn't change, you know, significantly year to year. Um, the adage of throw enough mud and hope some of it sticks absolutely applies in this particular instance. I mean, if they wanted to, he could have written a letter off to the Australian Federal Police and that would have been it. Uh, but instead, it's all about the positioning and the grandstanding. And that's fine. You know, that's the opposition's job to do. And I think that Australians get that. So that's to be expected. But if I could just go back for a second, this notion that people here are talking about a deal being done for Malcolm to become leader and nothing would change, I mean, that's just wrong. That, that is complete <laughs> rubbish. Did a specific no, deal no, with that, the was, that was complete rubbish. The fact is that the down. Liberal Party... Well, Lenore, I was there, with the greatest respect, in the party room. And the party room took the decision to... The very big decision to change Prime Minister. There was nothing said about deals being done, about no policy changes and things like that. Different people took different decisions and positions about who they wanted to lead the party. Malcolm Turnbull is now leading the Liberal Party and he's Prime Minister of our country. Can I, can I just, makes um, calls. just on that um, score, can I ask you to... Perhaps you could give us a very short list of the sure. of the really major policy changes that we've seen. But it's not no because Knights it's not dames, about it's not we've about it is not about <laughs> the policy changes. You see, you're operating on the basis of saying, oh, well, this Malcolm was all said done. It was about for... economic leadership. That's, That's what really he told the, the nation. Yeah. What have saying... we seen in that front? Flip flop. Hang on, we'll let him finish. You're saying this is about uh, policy changes and what has Malcolm done differently? I'm saying it's not about that. It's about leadership. Mm. You see, it wasn't about just changing policy because if it was just about changing policy, guess what? Tony Abbott could have changed policy. This was a more fundamental decision for the party about who he wanted to lead the party 
and how we wanted them to lead the party. Now, Malcolm Turnbull has made it crystal clear from day one that it's not about captain's picks, it's about cabinet decisions. He wants to run an old-style, traditional government that has cabinet-making policy decisions. And guess what? That's what's happening. Terry Butler. Um, and stick to the first part of the question, if you if you wouldn't mind, which was about Stuart Robert. AFP. Look, I think that Mark Dreyfus, Mark's a QC, is someone who uh, is very experienced in the law. And he obviously, after Stuart Robert made the admission in respect of what, what I understand to have been an admission, I haven't seen the news, um, having shares in the company that he went to China to promote. While being a minister, I think that Mark's done the obvious thing, which is to ask for an investigation, obviously. Um, misconduct in public office is a very serious question. Uh, so I think it's it's responsible. But look, I, I, I've got to say, I mean, I thought... I mean, Steve's actually known for his chutzpah, right? Like, this is a guy who spoke out against the Gold Coast Light Rail and then turned up to open it. So I think he's... Um, <laughs> I think he's I think well known um, for it. But look... When did I speak this out against whole, this, this, but this entire Terry, idea I, of throwing mud... No, 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 but I'm this not going to let This entire idea of oppositions throwing mud. I mean, these are the people who held an $80 million Royal Commission in an attempt to get Julia right, Gillard... I'm going to say, we, we, don't wanna, we don't want to spend a lot of time going down this... I, I just this, ask I'm one, sorry, one this, quick this light railway one track, but... Um, <laughs> you can very briefly one, one respond. One question. <laughs> Terry said I spoke out against it. Name one thing that oh, I said I'm against sorry, it. I'm sorry, Steve. No, no, hang on, this is not a kind of you said, no, but, who said, but, who said. It's just, gonna, well, just tell us if you support it or not. That's, yes, that absolutely, I, and okay, I always right. did, and what she said was completely okay. Now, false. Lenore Taylor, I'll bring you in um, to go back to the Stuart Robert question. And the broader part of that was, um, is this cabinet reshuffle um, a way to distract attention from everything that's happening? Well, the um, cabinet reshuffle was a necessity because uh, a couple of people were retiring after long and distinguished careers and three had had various scandals or problems which meant that they had to leave the ministry. So it was sort of wrapping up in rejuvenation something that was forced upon the Prime Ministership, but, but upon the Prime Minister. But I wanted to take up Steve's point where he said nothing ever changes. And in a different way, I think, on this point, that's absolutely true. The thing that never changes is that we never seem to reform political donations laws and we never seem to change the relationship between the political parties and big money. We know what to do. We've tried... We've had a proposition before the parliament for years now. The major parties know what needs to happen with reducing the levels of disclosure and increasing public funding so they don't have to go with their begging bowls or get all chummy with donors in order to just get the money to run campaigns. And I think that uh, these scandals come and they go and the person resigns if there's enough political pressure. But the only thing that's going to change the system is if we change donation laws and change the relationship between politicians and big money. Sarah Hanson, yeah? Yeah, I'll, Mark, you can, I'll bring you in the mail. I totally agree with Lenore that uh, donations reform needs to happen and it needs to happen fast. The, the ridiculous thing is we now have different rules across the country. The, different states have different rules and, of course, you know, if you wanted to uh, bypass rules here in New South Wales, you'd donate to the, the Federal Liberal Party or the Federal Labor Party um, in order to get your donation through the door. And we saw that with the pokies debate, I think, and, and donations from, from Clubs Australia strongly. Um, and, you know, with all the threats that are being um, aired over the last 24 hours from Property Council and various uh, development um, interests, you wonder where that's going in terms of the debate around uh, capital gains tax. Uh, the point I wanted to make, I've, I found it quite astounding, actually, watching the press conference of the Prime Minister on Saturday, where he said it was all part of his great big plan, this reshuffle, and he'd always planned it. Um, no, it was forced upon you because um, you've got a couple of disgraced ministers, you've got people retiring. Um, I think we've heard the speech about renewal and bringing in uh, fresh blood and, 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 and younger uh, members of the team three times now. I mean, when is the Prime Minister going to say, this is my team, this is who I have faith in and this is the direction we're going? Um, Steve talks about leadership. OK, well, leadership to where and leadership for what? Because at the moment, it's just not there. Mark Stein. Uh, I, think it's, I think it's more basic than reforming uh, the organisation uh, of politics. I, I want to be governed by uh, honourable men and honourable women. And uh, my compatriot uh, from Canada, George Jonas, he had a, a very famous line. Uh, something isn't wrong because it's illegal. It's illegal because it's wrong. And if a, uh, if a Minister of the Crown in Canada or here doesn't know that what happened in this instance is wrong, 
It doesn't matter. You can have all the rules. You can have a rule book that's 3,000 pages high. Uh, honorable government depends on people who understand, before they check page 2,731, that what the situation they're getting themselves into is wrong. I'm not saying you should be uh, criminally investigated or tossed in jail or shipped to Nauru or whatever. Uh, but what he did was wrong, and what's sad about it is that he didn't know till it came out that it was wrong. That's what's depressing. I'll paraphrase uh, another famous quote as well, this one from uh, Oscar Wilde. Uh, is a paraphrase. To lose one minister may be regarded as a misfortune. <laughs> to lose three is carelessness. <laughs> um, we can move on, I think. Remember, if you hear any doubtful claims on Q&A, um, including that quote, send a tweet using the <laughs> hashtags factcheck and quanda and keep an eye on our Twitter account for fact checks by The Conversation or the ABC <laughs> Fact Checking Unit. Our next question comes from Bilal Trad. Uh, my question is for Mr. Stein. Uh, so you're, you're an advocate, uh, a strong advocate for free speech. Uh, however, would you not agree that it's important that uh, one is informed about what they're, they're talking about? You know, Ill-informed free speech can be dangerous. Um, perhaps what we should be encouraging more is informed speech. You know, people not just talking because they can, but because they deserve to, rather than spouting hate. Uh, why should it be the, only the loudest voice is heard? Mark Stein. Well, the, the way to defeat uh, someone who is speaking who is ill-informed is, uh, is to argue it out uh, with them in the marketplace of ideas. Uh, but, but no position should command special protection. Uh, in a free society, that's effectively a kind of apostasy uh, law, that you're saying uh, you, you can't hold certain positions on this or certain positions on that. If positions are weak, if positions are ignorant, they'll be defeated in the marketplace of ideas, which is the essential freedom that distinguishes genuinely free societies uh, from ersatz societies, where speech is policed uh, by commissions and regulators and commissars and various branches of government. Uh, there is no argument that can be made for government regulation of speech, even if, uh, and I'm happy to admit to being the dumbest, stupid, biggest moron on the panel. Uh, that, that doesn't matter. Uh, there's a difference between saying you're stupid and saying there's a government commission uh, that should restrict your but right Mark, to free Mark, speech. When I was in practice, someone came to mm. me and said that their neighbour had called their very young daughter mm. a half-caste mm. in front of them mm. and in front of the daughter. Mm. Now, that's why we have racial vilification laws in this country. <laughs> well, so... Well, look, can I just throw that to you as a, as a question mark? Does that include what you're saying, that principle, does it include what has become to be known as hate speech? Well, I, I think what... Uh, I think, I think the, the, the example Terry gives is, is what, are, what are called fighting words in, uh, in, in US law. Uh, and I think people are entitled... I certainly wouldn't take that lying down if somebody uh, said it to, to my child. Uh, but, the, uh, but the idea that you criminalise certain words, I think, becomes very dangerous, because we, especially because we live in a, we live in a, a, a culture in which uh, who can say certain words depends on who they are. The, the N-word, as they call it in the United States, a derogatory term for black people, uh, makes up a big chunk of 80% uh, of, of rap records. Uh, queer used to be a pejorative term, uh, and then people reclaimed it and started using it. You get into very dark territory when you start uh, criminalising language. But that's a red herring because most of these laws are civil. There's mm. people suing each other, not police enforcing the law and putting people in jail. I don't, I don't, I don't think there's any, I don't think there's anything to be gained by that, and I think the loss. Uh, in the loss in policing uh, attitudes and policing opinions uh, is is greater than the good. If some, if your neighbour across the fence uh, calls you a racially derogatory epithet, uh, yes, you can sue her and take her to the courts for five or six years uh, and uh, ruin her life and get uh, a settlement of some few thousand dollars out of her. Uh, but in the end, that doesn't, that doesn't change uh, who she is or what she said. And that's so better settled between the two of Can you. Can I just... Uh, I was going to bring in a couple of other panellists. And Sarah Hanson-Young, you've been listening to this. Um, now, uh,
can free speech ever be dangerous, I suppose, is one way of putting it. I think, you know, always the balance with, with this debate is um, if we want free speech and we want that um, respected uh, and we want to uh, encourage a respectful engagement of free speech, which I think if you don't do that, um, it becomes... Uh, it, it, it really does go down that barrow of, uh, of, of hate speech. Um, but it comes with responsibility. And I think this, <laughs> this is always the issue. If, if you want freedom, you have to have some element of responsibility. And, you know, the, the irony of the whole debate about um, amending the Racial Discrimination Act on the back of the um, Andrew Bolt case, it wasn't because of uh, his opinion um, that he was he lost in the courts. It's because his facts were wrong. Um, and that often gets lost. I'll just, I'll just make the point, um, uh, Sarah, Change.org has just put out an online petition mm. day calling for the Prime Minister to intervene to censure Alan Jones for comments he made uh, on the radio about the stolen generation. I mean, mm. do you think that crossed uh, some kind of invisible line or was, is he free to say these things? I think... Uh, you know, Alan Jones. I mean, I don't know if he's getting more and more senile day by day, but, you know... Wh well, I can what... tell you he's not senile. We've had him on this programme <laughs> several times and there's no evidence of that whatsoever. No, and, you know, he might he might be offended that I've said that, but oh. he's a big promoter of free speech, so I'm sure he won't have a problem with it. Um, <laughs> I suspect he might. <laughs> but, but I think, obviously, to actually to go to the point, because it was they were very serious comments he said today, uh, and I think extremely hurtful, uh, promoting the idea that we need to see um, a second stolen generation. In, frankly, um, there are... The, you know, Indigenous children at the moment are ten times more likely to be living out of home right now. Now, that is a, a shame on our, on our national character in terms of how we look after the next generation of young Indigenous people, and we do have to tackle that. And I don't think it's helped... Uh, by uh, really... Well, can I just say, very quickly, I mean, do you consider that to be a second stolen generation already? Because if so, it's happened under Labor and Liberal governments uh, in the modern era. I mean, is that what you're calling it? I haven't called it that, Tony, but some people are questioning whether we've learnt um, from the mistakes of the past uh, enough and wonder how, uh, how much we really have taken on board uh, when we said sorry. But, but Alan's, Alan Jones's remark, I think, I think gets to the heart of it. You can, ob you can object to that. But in this particular issue, uh, I think that's the value of free speech. I think when you look at what has happened to Indigenous... I don't, I'm not an expert in Indigenous populations in Australia, but I certainly know a lot about it in Canada. That's a subject that is already hedged in and protected uh, by kind of tiptoeing on eggshells around the subject. And it would actually benefit from a more robust debate. And if you restrict that debate, if you end up with the situation that they have in Germany at the moment, for example, when what happened on New Year's Eve in Cologne, where there was a mass sexual assault, uh, and because it happened to um, contradict the official narrative, the police... Uh, the media and the government declined to report it for over a week and cracked down on social media uh, on people who expressed opinions of it. Well, if people can't... If you can't say what you think about a subject, the only alternative is to punch yeah. somebody's lights well, out. Okay, you can't I'm, say so... what you think without <laughs> yeah. vilifying people, then perhaps you need to think about whether you're smart enough to be making the, con the no, contribution. No, but, the... Okay, no, so I'm, I'm gonna, we, we've, got a, we've got a silent <laughs> half of the panel over here, and I want to bring them in. I'll bring Steve Chobo in first. So, so uh, Steve Chobo, should uh, people, for example, in a forum like this, be able to say whatever they think? Well, I'm attracted to the classic uh, you know, liberal freedoms uh, as a starting point. But, of course, it doesn't apply uh, carte blanche. I mean, you've got to have... It doesn't apply to Zaki some... Mala, for yeah. example. It does, does it, doesn't you've apply to, to have... marriage equality, you've, for you've example. Got to have, it doesn't apply uh... to misleading and deceptive conduct in trade and commerce. I mean, let's be realistic. <laughs> <laughs> OK, sorry. <laughs> Very exciting in that half of the panel. I must yeah. have had the caffeine and we didn't. <laughs> you're anyway, back, I, I you're back on. You're back saying, on. I, so I am, I am, yeah. I am uh, attracted to the principle, but, but there, are, there do need to be limits on it. And, uh, and I think that that's a reasonable position. Um, you know, we can have so a debate. Where, where would you draw the limits? Well, I mean, look, we can have a debate. You know, what I find slightly troubling is Sarah makes a comment uh, about how you know, she finds certain things that are said in a, in a vilifying way inappropriate. 
and then turns around and, and says, well, Alan Jones is senile, in a very pejorative sense. Not, don't, don't claim you're trying to say it in a, in a medical sense. I mean, it was a very pejorative no, sense. I think that's a And this is the problem, question. you see, because I think that if, if you want to be able to say that... You know, Tony, as a, as a public figure, let me tell you, my Twitter stream, probably as we speak now, is lighting up with people with, you know, not too many nice things to say about me. Um, I get the odd good one, but a lot of, a lot of negative ones. Um, but you know what? That's just part of being a public figure and it's part of the national debate that we have. So I, on balance, I would always default to saying we have more robust conversation rather than trying to put false limits up with some kind of independent arbiter about what can and cannot be said. Um, but you did say there should be limits. And so I guess sure. the, the question still remains, you know, where would you draw the line? But, I mean, that, look, that's a hard question to answer. Um, you know, the Cabinet's taken the decision with respect to 18C. I mean, that's probably germane to this discussion that we're going to leave it as it is. Um, I know some people are unhappy with it. Some people probably don't think it goes far enough. Um, I think if you did a poll of, of all the audience members, you know, people would have different points of view about how much is acceptable and, and how much isn't. Um, I, as I said, my principle in making a decision around this is more freedom is better than less freedom, uh, especially when it comes to ideas. Lenore Taylor. So, um, Steve Chobo says the Cabinet took that decision and that's correct. And the reason that they took that decision was that even with all the sort of zeal of the Ab that the Abbott government brought to bear to try to change the Racial Discrimination Act, what they discovered was that there was a backlash from those sections of our community who are subject to racial discrimination, and I would point out that nobody on this panel is actually in that circumstance, probably, um, that the backlash was so strong that they really just politically couldn't go ahead with it and didn't go ahead with it. I personally think that Section 80C might be drawn slightly too broadly, but there has to be some kind of recourse for racial vilification, and I don't want to live in a society where racial vilification is OK. I was going to go back to our questioner who started all this off, Bilal Trad. Um, you had your hand up. Yep. Um, so you spoke a lot to uh, offensive words, but I, I think um, more what I was referring to is, um, you know, news anchors, politicians, people who have uh, a large amount of influence over the people, you know, over their audience. I think it's important. I think they owe it to the, the people that they be speaking the truth. You know, you can't lie in advertising. Why should you be able to on the news? OK, we'll, we'll take that as a comment and let it wrap up that <laughs> section and I'll move on to our next question, which is sort of related, and it's from Margot Davis. Um, Australia has become such a nanny state um, that there's more signage about what not to do um, than how to get the most out of life in Australia. Lockout laws um, restrict opening hours and intend to in restrict al alcohol sales. Um, and are damaging our culture and our freedom to choose what we want and how we want to live our life, not to mention the impact on small business. What are you going to do to stem what's quickly becoming an insult to the vast majority of Australians who are intelligent, progressive and responsible members of our country before it ends in civil unrest and a fight for our independence? Steve Chobo. Call to arms. Uh, well, look, uh, lockout laws, I mean, I've made some comments about that in the last 24 hours. I mean, I, I do think uh, the lockout laws go too far. I mean, I know it's not specifically about lockout laws. I've written op-eds in the past uh, about how I think... Uh, that I think we that need question to have was a... specifically about lockout laws, as a matter of fact. Well, I mean, I, I, I do think that Australia has gone too far down the path of trying to regulate so many aspects of people's lives. I, I genuinely do. And I think that it was, uh, it's high time that we had a good hard look at opportunities to deregulate some of these areas. Um, because, you know, I, if you take, for example, lockout laws, and I know here in New South Wales it's currently in place, and uh, the Premier Mike Baird's said, well, assaults are down 44%. But, you know, well, how does that sit with the way in which patronage is down? Um, I heard someone quip, well, there were zero assaults in the Simpson Desert too. Um, you know, so I personally think, look, we're adults. We, we live in a free society. If people do the wrong thing, and, and you want to do everything you can to try to prevent that, including education around, for example, cowards, punches and all those things, but ultimately you can't stop someone from making a stupid choice. So the Queensland Premier has uh, bought into this now. Yeah. Um, Premier Palaszczuk is looking to bring in lockout laws in Queensland. And uh, 
citing concerns in places like the Gold Coast uh, where you're the MP. Yeah. Um, it's, it's quite risky for her to do this because Queensland, uh, I think Queenslanders do like their kind of live free or die sort of qualities. So uh, <laughs> you, do you think that's actually going to be a problem? You're comparing Queensland and New Hampshire. Well, uh, to some degree, um, yes. Look, I, I, it, I, it is a problem on the Gold Coast. I mean, the Gold Coast is, a, is, for lack of a better term, considered a party town. We get 11 to 12 million tourists there and a lot of them come because they think it's a great place to go and have a holiday. Um, they don't want to be in a situation where they're told, well, you know, you, you can't buy a bottle of wine after 10pm, for example, as, as, as is the case, as I understand it, here in New South Wales. And they don't want to be um, punched by a, a drunk in, but you know in, what? in on the streets at that time. Yeah. No, that's part of the equation that led to the lockout laws here. Obviously. Sure, but Tony, you know, I'm I'm 41. I like to think it wasn't that long ago that I, I'd have a night out. Um, you went out and you sort of knew that that it, was there a chance that I mean, we know that if you're a young male, you've got the highest chance of assault, the highest risk of assault. I recognise that, but still, we're talking about a tiny little percentage, which doesn't make it acceptable. But let's not lose sight of the fact that there's a much larger percentage that actually do the responsible thing in the same way that there's a large percentage that don't speed all the time and there's a small percentage that do. But we don't put speed limits on cars and say, well, a car can only go 100. We put up a sign that says 100 is what's recommended. So, to me, and it's the same sort of principle. if you go beyond 100, you generally get a fine if there's a policeman around. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it, to me, it's the same sort of principle. Yeah. I'm going to go to... Terry Butler's also um, from Queensland. I am and, a Queenslander, that uh, is Well, in actual fact, Fortitude Valley is another one of those places like uh, the Gold Coast where people say it's dangerous to go out late at night because of too many drunken youths or too many drunken men in the street. I know, those places with Liberal members. Seriously, Tony. Um, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, Fortitude Valley is across the river from my electorate in the Federal Electorate of Brisbane. Look, I think this is a complicated question. Um, there are lots of different studies and considerations around about the connection between alcohol and violence. I know you think that it's a big call for Anastasia, but remember that in Anastasia's cabinet is a maxillofacial surgeon who's had to reconstruct the faces of young people who've had terrible violent attacks visited upon them. And I know that some people are saying, well, why should I be inconvenienced because other people are violence to other people? But at some point we have to recognise that we live in a society and trying to help to reduce the amount of physical harm to other people is not an unreasonable request, even if it does mean going home at 2am instead of 3am. Or I'm not really familiar with the lockout laws, but, you know, whatever. It's a big time. call for her because she's got a wafer-thin majority and uh, some of the people she relies on live in northern Queensland where they don't favour these kind of laws. Well, someone who grew up there, uh, I can only imagine that there would be some strong views about it. But look... The thing about Anastasia that people... I mean, you've met her, so you know. She is driven by what she thinks is right. She's another person with very strong values. Agree with them or not, at least she's got them. And so I think that when she sees that something is important, when she sees that a change needs to be made, then she will pursue it. Uh, I don't myself have a, enough of a handle on the empirical evidence around the connection between alcohol and violence. I know that in relation to domestic violence, for example, uh, the Foundation for Alcohol... Uh, research has put out some material about a connection between family violence and alcohol. That was something that was very much canvassed in the Time for Action report, which was a national report on family violence in 2009. So th these are complicated questions, but, you know, I think when it comes down to it, yes, some of us are asked to be more responsible or, you know, take one for the team when it comes to co going home at two instead of three. But if we're doing it for a good reason, which is going to mean that a mate of mine, her son was bashed up in, in a hotel in Brisbane recently. Broken teeth, he had a job interview the next day. It was one of those coward punch situations. He was lucky. All he had was broken teeth and bruises. People have died. I think that trying to deal with that is an important thing to do. Okay. Um, now, will everyone try and keep their answers a little I, I, I didn't long. want to interrupt that no, particular but story, but, um, but we've got quite a few questions to get through. Mark Stein, uh, you actually live in a state where they do have the motto, live free or die. Yeah, that, that's New Hampshire's motto. We, we don't have... Uh, you don't have to wear a seatbelt in New Hampshire and you don't have to wear a helmet when you ride a motorcycle. So it's, it's uh, different for me to watch grown men uh, wearing a helmet to ride a bicycle very genteely around a Sydney park. It's a different way of looking at things. <laughs> and I think if you, if you look to the government to insulate you uh, against risk in that way, like riding a bicycle around a park on a Sunday afternoon, it's very difficult to argue that uh, untrammeled access to liquor 
until four in the morning should be an exception to that. Um, so I, I, think, I think in a generally regulated society, the, the, the state, it's hard to argue that, that keeping bars open till three or four in the morning uh, should, should be a, exempt from that. As a practical matter, uh, I don't, I don't, the evidence is unclear. In Britain, the pubs used to close at 10.30 and there were last orders, so there were 15 minutes. And everybody, because everybody knew that the pubs closed at 10.30, they'd have like 12 pints in the last 15 minutes. They'd call last orders and uh, the landlady would line up 12 pints on the, uh, on, on the counter and they'd, and they'd drink 12 pints in 15 minutes, then stagger out into the street, all nutting each other and glassing each other and uh, doing all these other things. And, and the, uh, I think it was Mr. Blair's ministry or Mr. Majors, I can't remember, but they extended the licensing laws on the grounds that if people could drink in a more sophisticated manner, like the French do, uh, then they'd be stabbing and knifing each other a lot less uh, than they <coughs> do by having 12 pints in 15 minutes. So the evidence is a bit contradictory on this. But the fact is, if the, if the, if the state treats you like a child in every other area of life, uh, then it can't let you stay out drinking till four in the morning. I mean, that's part of a package. In well, I mean, in your state, actually, uh, does treat people as children until they're 21 because yeah. you're not allowed to drink. So you've got a three-year lockout period from 18 to no, 21. No, no, my part of the world, lockout. they all go into uh, Canada where you, can, where you can drink there and then they come roaring drunk back through the US border post and the US immigration guy doesn't bother stopping them because he thinks, it's, he thinks uh, drunk driving is for the local constable and it's beneath his grand federal status okay. uh, to stop that. Right. So, you Let, know, there's... Let's, uh, let's, uh, let's move on. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's fascinating, it's fascinating a piece of anthropology. <laughs> Sorry, I've, 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 uh, next network, next question, a uh, very different subject from uh, Margaret Bell. Oh, thanks, Tony. Um, my question to the whole panel is, um, although it's an obligation on us all to support some members of our society, is the Labor's push to reduce uh, or get rid of um, negative gearing and cha make changes to superannuation contributions a disincentive for people to provide for their own retirement? Now, is it fair to expect people or to, to have a society that relies on taxpayer Ta taxpayers for their income stream when they're retired. I'll just start with Lenore on this to clear up a few things. I mean, they're not obviously uh, trying to get rid of negative gearing no. altogether, but just simply to change it so that it only applies to new dwellings. And, and it's grandfathered, so it doesn't apply to any existing investments. I actually think it's a sensible policy. I think negative gearing has been a tax lurk primarily used by wealthier people, contrary to some of the data that's been put out. But I think when you look at the actual figures, it's primarily high income earners using it. I think it's the right decision to grandfather it because people have made investment decisions in good faith and they shouldn't be penalised for that on their existing investments. But it's uh, put upward pressure on housing prices and it hasn't fulfilled its basic policy aim, which is to encourage investment in new houses because almost all of the negatively, negative gearing investment goes to uh, existing houses. So I actually think it's uh, a, an interesting policy deserves to be debated, the coalition's going to come up with their own version of what they're going to do about negative gearing. And I think that's a good thing because, you know, politicians have been running scared of this issue for decades because they're really terrified of the backlash. And the other thing, just taking up with what Sarah said before, I do really hope, like, this time they won't turn tail and head for the hills because some industry lobby group is threatening a marginal seats campaign. Can I We've seen go that back, before and it would I, be good to not have that again. Sorry, Lou. I'll just quickly go back to uh, Margaret. I mean, hearing that you wouldn't be, in fact, affected by that policy, does it change the way you think about it? Or, do you, or are you thinking that generally uh, you need to have these investment possibilities? Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking that you would probably need to have some form of income stream that makes you non-reliant on, on the government or the taxpayers when you're retired. And so... It doesn't have to be a million dollar home, it can be a couple of not too expensive units or something that gives you a steady income stream that you pay tax on. But as I understand type. what they're proposing, if you've already got an investment, you keep the income stream from that investment and if you want to make a future investment, you can make it in a new housing development and you can continue to get an income stream from that or you can make other choices about your retirement investment. Let me go across the panel to uh, Sarah Hanson-Young. Um, I know this is not your policy particularly, but, um, but I want to hear you. We didn't actually hear you in the last question. So. <laughs> Look, uh, obviously, 
uh, I, mean, I indicated before, I think um, we do need to tackle um, the issues in relation to capital ta gains tax and, and also negative gearing. Um, and it's great, actually, to see the Labor Party now coming forward as well. I think, and, and Malcolm Turnbull, to his credit, didn't rule it out today. I, I actually think this is a, a really um, interesting space if we've got the courage to follow through. Um, the reality is we do have um, a revenue problem in this country. We've, we've, we want to fund services. We want good aged care. We want good hospitals. We want good schools for our kids. Um, that'll cost money and we've got to raise it from somewhere. And at the moment, what we're seeing is that those who are um, earning the most money, uh, particularly in this area of um, uh, investment in terms of housing stock, are getting a pretty good ride at the cost of everybody else. And let me put it this way. If you were earning $100,000 in income as a builder, you would pay the tax you need to pay. If you were earning $100,000 on an investment property, you would pay half the amount of tax as the guy who built the house. And it's just not fair. And uh, I think it is time that we tackled it. OK, I'll bring Terry in. It's uh, Labor's policy that's being discussed here with some um, perhaps misunderstandings as to how it applies. But it was a very brave move in one sense because I, I recall when uh, Mark Latham tried to do this, suggest this in opposition and canned the policy uh, within 12 hours, I think it was, and um, he was... Peter Costello famously said, there's a policy you couldn't keep from late line to lunchtime. <laughs> well, look, we're not canning the policy. This is a policy that Chris Bowen and others in our caucus have worked on for 12 months. It's a very carefully considered policy. One of the reasons that we want to say that in the future, if you want to negatively gear, you have to buy a new property, not an existing property, is because we want to drive up supply of housing in Australia because there's a housing affordability problem. If you've got any friends who've got their 30-year-old kids still living with them because they can't afford a deposit, you know what I'm talking about, right? Like, everyone wants those kids to move out, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, don't want my, I love my kids. I don't want them living with me when they're 30 because they can't afford a deposit. So <laughs> we need to drive up supply. And one of the ways to do that is to properly incentivise our negative gearing. So at the moment, only 7% of negative gearing is on new properties. The rest is on existing properties, so old stock. Uh, we want to target it more. We definitely do. Absolutely right. We also think um, there's a bit of misinformation around. One example is there's a suggestion that really it's middle class people who will be most affected. Actually, a surgeon is 100 times more likely than a cleaner to have a neg negatively geared property portfolio. So it's really important to, to be clear about what we're talking about. Um, I also want to be clear about what Malcolm Turnbull and Steve Chobo. Well, actually, let's are ask him. About, let, let's so be clear really and important. let's hear what they well, because, say. Because, because I, I'd rather hear what, what they say they today. think than you say they think. But I'd like, um, them, so I'd like to know what they think about retrospectivity, though, right, Tony. Okay. Um, well, no surprise, I think, that Labor's policy is rubbish. Um, <laughs> and, Unless you subsequently and, adopt it. Well, no, well, we, won't, we won't be adopted. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, Statement all over again. Let me be clear, we won't be adopting Labor's policy. Uh, and the reason why Labor's policy is rubbish is, is for a multiple of reasons. Uh, the first, to pick up on Lenore's point that negative gearing is about improving housing stock. Uh, I'm sorry, Lenore, but that's completely wrong. Negative gearing has nothing to do with housing stock at all. Um, you can have negative gearing in relation to shares. That's not about trying to drive more people into new shares. You but can the have rationale negative gearing... for the policy initially no, it's, had no, it's to not. do with housing stock. No, it stock. did not. It has never had anything to do with housing well, stock. Because negative gearing, the... negative gearing applies to absolutely any asset class. And what sure, it says but is as that it applied to housing, the... it was to drive, drive up housing supply. No, that was the point Lenore, of it. I'm sorry, that's incorrect. It's about... It's about being able to invest in any asset class, shares, housing, whatever it is, gold bullion if you want. And what it says is that if you're borrowing money to invest in that the asset, then you're you able to deduct uh, the extra cost of the interest that you're paying over the revenue you get from that particular asset. Now, the reason why I think that Labor's policy is rubbish is because it's going to raise around $600 million over four years. Now, that is less than one month's interest bill on the amount of debt that we're servicing every single month. So over four years, less than one month's interest bill. But what they're going to do is they're going to say, well, if you've got an existing house or an existing apartment, guess what? If you want to sell that down the track and an investor no longer can buy that house, well, they can, but they're unlikely to for the exact reasons that Terry outlined, because they're going to be pushed by Labor's policy into new stock only, 
guess what? There's basically not going to be very much of a market for your resale. And furthermore... Wouldn't that actually that help housing affordability? Uh, I'm just saying, um, if you're trying to get into the market, wouldn't that be an advantage? Well, well, you can't uh, have There are an awful lot of people who can't sure, get into the market. But you can't have... If housing stock becomes... Because it's, it's more unaffordable yeah. in Australia than virtually anywhere in the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if it becomes cheaper to buy a house, doesn't that benefit <laughs> a lot more people? You can't have it both ways, though, Tony, you see, because Labor says, well, hang on, negative gearing is the domain of the filthy rich who are going in there and they're buying, you know, if you're a surgeon, you're going to buy all these homes. Well, guess what? Negative gearing either drives people to invest in real estate or it doesn't. So my point is that if you can't... Labor's position is that they're, they're, they're stuck on with a foot on either side of the fence, claiming the... that this is going to actually push down prices, this is why but at the no same time saying that actually drive more people into new housing stock. So this is the fundamental problem with Labor's policy, um, because it is going to have a massive distorting effect on resales, and it's going to drive investors into okay. new housing stock. Right. I babble, think your problem with it is that Bill Shorten's been brave enough to do it and Malcolm Turnbull hasn't. No. I think that's yeah. the real problem with it. OK, I, I, I'm, gonna, I'm sorry, I'm going to leave it there because um, we've covered both sides of the argument in a fairly superficial way, I have to admit, but we have at least covered it. Um, we've got another question on a different subject from Joy Donovan. Detention centres. Um, there are 926 uh, detainees on Manus, Manus Island and 543 on Nauru. I communicate with a Kurdish... Iranian man on Manus Island. He's been there for 30 months. He is... Uh, he knew Reza Barati. He also knew, or knows, knew... Um, uh, <laughs> Benham Sattar. Benham Sattar. Benham Sattar. I have, a, is, I have your question in front of me, so yeah, I... That's yeah. <laughs> who is the witness at the trial? Um, he has been there for 30 months. He's 30 years old. He is severely depressed. He is unable to sleep. He is not eating. Um, he is he's feeling that he might die there. And he is he's been assessed as a UN refugee. Um, my question is to the panel. What can you do, what can you say to our government <coughs> and to the people of Australia that could encourage our government to change this, this okay. awful situation? All right. Um, let's try and keep our answers relatively brief. I know it's going to be difficult. Sarah Hanson-Young, I'll start with you. Thank you for your question. Um, sadly, um, your friend's circumstance is, is not unique in that group of people on Manus Island. That's um, all of the people who have been there have been there um, for around the same amount of time, um, along with um, the families, the women and children on, on Nauru, and um, they're all losing, losing hope. Um, it's a awful, awful circumstance, and it's something that we have to tackle. The truth is the government doesn't have an exit strategy for Nauru and Manus Island, and they need to get one because uh, it's not sustainable. Um, you can't um, continue to leave um, uh, hundreds of people uh, effectively rotting in these camps. And that, that I visited them. I'm one of the few people in this country who has been allowed to go inside these camps and to see them. And unlike the doctors and the nurses and the other the guards who work in these places, I'm not gagged to tell uh, the story of what goes on in there. Um, luckily, and it's, it's, I'm very, very grateful I've had that opportunity to be able to explain um, just how uh, inhumane these places are. We need uh, a way out of this. Um, th the fact is, <coughs> Labor and Liberal both say, um, let's send these people offshore and forget about them and uh, let's send them there and hope, after all this time, that they will give up. It's actually... The deterrent... Don't be mistaken here. The deterrence policy is designed to break people and to say, uh, we'll, send, we'll, we'll make it as difficult as possible so you give up and go home. I can tell you what, after 30 months, if they haven't given up yet and gone home and they've been assessed as refugees, that's because they can't. That's because they can't go home. Sarah, we'll... We need, um... to, we need to bring them... 
uh, to Australia, let them stay and um, get on with having a more humane approach to Okay, sorry to you had a microphone problem, but it's, it's actually repaired itself. Um, Mark Stein. Uh, well, I might as well play the, uh, the token right-wing madman uh, for a moment. Um, I'm, a, I'm as unsympathetic uh, to, to the refugee issue in general as you can get. I think the great population migrations that are underway are, uh, are a terrible thing and I, I, and, and I would like the evil of human trafficking to cease. And it is the case uh, around the world that many people are essentially economic refugees and it would be better uh, for the world uh, if their countries uh, were to be made uh, more habitable. That said, uh, I, have, I have problems with what is going on in Nauru and Papua New Guinea, which, which seems to me, uh, as a basically an old school imperialist, uh, to be colonialism uh, with all the defects and, and none of uh, the benefits. If you are going to warehouse, I, if you're going to warehouse people in essentially former Australian uh, colonies, um, then I think you have an obligation to process them expeditiously. There's no reason why uh, people should be there uh, for two and a half years. I also think you have a, a responsibility uh, to, to own the problem. So you don't contract it to a private contractor. Uh, the government of Australia, if it's going to do some deal with the government of Nauru or, or the government of Papua New Guinea to put camps there, has responsibility to run those camps and ensure, for example, there, is, there are first world medical facilities there. There's absolutely no reason uh, why uh, people should, uh, should be there two and a half years and why they should be in, uh, in those conditions. Uh, as I said, I'm, unsympath I'm broadly unsympathetic to the casual way uh, everybody attempting to get into a first world country is these days pegged as a refugee. That's, that's nonsense. Uh, we, we need to have a far clearer understanding of what that category is. But two and a half, two and a half years under a camp run by private contractors is, is not an acceptable, uh, uh, an acceptable policy. Okay. Uh, the government of Australia should own this policy. Okay, Steve Chobo, should you own the policy and uh, why is there no end in sight? Well, we do own the policy um, and we absolutely own the policy because we saw the repercussions of a different set of policies. Um, we saw the but Should you own it in the sense that oh, it has just been described? But, but, but hang on, let's be clear about why we've taken this policy. Um, and the reason we've taken this policy is because when we had a different set of policies that accorded with you know, the views that Sarah has about bringing people into Australia, uh, we saw more than 50,000 people come to this country on more than 800 boats. We saw more than 1,200 people drown at sea, uh, which Sarah described as a tragic accident on Twitter, uh, and we saw a situation where basically organised criminal gangs were pushing as many people as possible through the pipeline to Australia. And when that was happening, the people who weren't coming to Australia as refugees were the people that were recognised by the UNHCR as being genuine refugees who were sitting in camps. So when we lost government in 2007, I'm going off memory here, I think can it was I, can, I just, can I just say this? I think that most of the people here and indeed most of the people watching at home are pretty familiar now with the background and with well, that argument. So that's here's, why the, here's, the here's the fundamental question that's raised by what that uh, person has asked. And it is 30 months is a very long time to live in limbo Look, uh, on Manus Island or anywhere. Right. Um, so the question is, is there an end in sight for those people? Yep. We it, give or options. is this indefinite detention? No, Tony, we give people options. So we give people options to resettle into a third country. In fact, the reason, and I don't know this particular individual what circumstances... What third country is on offer to this person? There's what third country? You had four people go to Cambodia, didn't you? Well, the, and what the, is the third those, country? You know, I, I, would have thought that, I would have thought that if you were fleeing persecution, the opportunity to end up in another country if you where ha you're you free of that persecution opportunity. would actually be them? something that you would relish. you people in camps for 30 so, months, you've just Terry, that. What's your position? My do you position support is offshore it's a disgrace that you've had got you support people in camps for 30 months. Well, how, many, how long were they in camps for? I'm the later part. OK, I'm just going to interrupt you. We actually had a question in the audience. A disgrace Where's, is, is Harry Gregg. Is thousands of people in detention, which is what you had under your policy. There, there is a question There's a difference specifically, between having offshore processing there is a question and having people in detention. Excuse me, there is a question specifically to you on this subject from Harry Gregg. Where's Harry Gregg? 
Thank you. Um, I was one of the delegates at the New South Wales Labor Conference on the weekend. Um, and I was proud to vote for a motion that urges Malcolm Turnbull to let refugees in limbo stay in Australia. This was unanimously supported by all delegates, unions, federal and state MPs of all factions, both left and right. Um, will our federal leader listen to our party? So, will Bill Shorten listen to what the party is saying is the question. Um, so that it raises the issue of whether you can really make that argument passionately when your own leader doesn't support it. Well, hang on, there's a bit... I guess there's a few things I want to say. The first thing is, if you accept, and I'm sure a number of people in this room don't accept it, but if you accept the proposition that you need to not have an advantage uh, by coming here in the unsafe means of a boat over and above coming here in the safe means of a plane, which is our policy. I mean, our, whole, our whole policy, our whole policy is about funding the UNHCR to $450 million so that people can get their refugee status determinations really, really quickly, and then we fly them here because we double the humanitarian intake. That's our policy, right? Um, but if you accept, and I think that there is some good, strong arguments to say that offshore processing is necessary to avoid providing what is colloquially called a pull factor for people to come the unsafe route. Uh, that does not necessitate the idea that you have to accept people sitting in tents for months and months and months, Christmas comes, Christmas goes, another Christmas comes around, that you, that you have to accept those ridiculous so conditions that people... Well, you know what you do? What's you have Labor's a genuine policy? regional What's resettlement Labor's process, policy? which you know is our policy. What, offshore pro offshore You know that our policy is regional resettlement. You're well aware of so that. You so can I, just, can I just confirm this? Your policy, policy is, is under no circumstances should those people come to Australia, and their policy is the same. Is it's that correct? It's the same policy. Fair, this look. is the madness of Labor's position. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, you, know, you think you're that you've got to have people living in poverty and in pain. When you're what you should have done is process them and got them resettled as quickly as you're possible, and you know it, Steve. Uh, you Steve, absolutely Steve know. Steve identified the real issue here, which is the the human trafficking is on a scale uh, which is which 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 facilitates the, the the explosion of economic migrants, is the equivalent of what slavery was in the early 19th century, when the the Royal Navy took it upon itself basically to uh, stop and intercept slaving ships and put those slavers out of the slavery business. And in the end, this thing is going to continue un until uh, the developed world uh, gets together and comes up with some strategy for actually smashing these networks, which now go all over the planet. And so, in a sense, we're talking about just band-aids on the symptoms rather than actually uh, uh, getting to the, the heart of the problem. Okay, I'm, so, I'm sorry. Sarah, you can have a very quick thanks, response. We've got you. another question to get to. The reality is that until there is a safe pathway offered, um, people are going to continue to be pushed into the hands of people smugglers. If we want to offer proper refuge to people, we have to uh, fund the assessment of them safely, bring them here safely, increase our humanitarian intake and be upfront about the fact that Australia's generous heart means we can welcome refugees and we can let them stay and we can do it proudly right. because actually that's, that's our country policy. is built on the back of people who have um, risked their life to get here and they make great Australians once they're right. here. It's time for one last question. <laughs> Thank you. It's from Charlie Hall. Charlie Hall. Go ahead. Uh, what are your thoughts on the possibility of Donald Trump possibly winning the Republican nomination and even possibly becoming the next president of the United States? Well, no, I'm going to go to you first. <laughs> it fills me with complete horror. I can't... <laughs> I mean, there's a thing going... There's a thing going on in politics around the world right now which is obviously fuelled by voters being dissatisfied with what major parties have been dishing up, the sort of very sterile soundbite kind of politics. But some people are addressing it in ideological ways, putting forward, you know, hard ass policies to address the concerns, people like Bernie Sanders, people like Jeremy Corbyn. And some people are addressing it like Donald Trump by just basically making stuff up. And the <laughs> idea that a bloke who just makes stuff up could be the President of the United States, I've got to say, I find deeply concerning. Steve Chobo, do you find it concerning or will you happily visit the Trump house? <laughs> <laughs> kind of a big Trump emblazoned on the side, yeah. Um, 
you know, the thing about democracies is that you've got to live with the choice of the people. That's right. Um, Tell so, that to the Russians. Well, <laughs> you know, it's, um, uh, it, it's, a, it's a curious thing, democracy, sometimes. I think Churchill said, you know, it's the, it's the worst form of government, but it's just better than all the rest. Um, <laughs> you know, if, if that's where the US population goes, that's where they go, and, and I will respect their judgment. Um, but look, I think, I do think that there's a number of policies, and it's not confined to Trump. I mean, there's policies that Hillary Clinton's put forward, that Bernie Sanders have put forward, a number of policies that, that trouble me. If it was me, I quite like Marco Rubio, or even there, there's some elements I don't particularly like. But, um, but that notwithstanding, you know, that's the benefit of a democracy. Um, yes, Terry Butler, um, Trump presidency. I think what we're seeing in the US at the moment um, <laughs> is a great example of why we should have compulsory voting. <laughs> Well, in fact, we do have compulsory voting. Absolutely, so you, it's very much wish reinfor <laughs> It's fortifying my existing view that compulsory <laughs> voting is a very good thing because it, it leads to more moderate outcomes. Would, it, would a Trump presidency make a Labor Party think twice about the US alliance? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Sarah Hanson Young. I, I actually think the interesting thing that's going on in the US, both with Trump and then Bernie Sanders, is actually it's ultimately a debate about inequality and it's tapping into something actually a little bit deeper than just the kind of um, crazy grabs of Trump on, on uh, television. Um, and I don't think we're immune to that here in Australia and I think the tax debate, um, if we wanted to have it properly, we could. Um, we do need to have a proper discussion about inequality. Um, Come on, and, we're talking about Donald we're, Trump here. Oh, no, no, but he, <laughs> He appeals to a particular group of people, Tony, because they think they're hard done by. Mm. Um, Bernie Sanders is um, getting uh, support in the polls because he's naming inequality and, in fact, dragging Hillary Clinton over to talk about those issues, and mm. that's really positive. So it, it's, it's funny, and I think, you know, if, if Donald, Donald Trump became uh, president, he'd make a great fodder for the comedians. Um, but, of course, uh, the deeper issue is... Uh, what, what is it that the US people actually are struggling with? And I think it is the widening gap between the rich and the poor. Mark, do you agree with that? Yeah, I think there's something to that. Uh, Terry made a, a good point that you have compulsory voting here, so everybody votes. In, in America, 52% vote. Half the country essentially doesn't vote. And that's because the, it's a rigid two-party system and whenever they switch on the TV, uh, neither party seems to be talking about anything that matters to them. The, the Democrat Party is often talking about recherche forms of identity politics. Uh, the Republican Party is often talking about Chamber of Commerce, trans-Pacific policy, that kind of thing. Both Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump are the same phenomenon. They're both populists. And if they each attract uh, an extra 10 or 15 per cent of people who don't vote, uh, into, the, uh, into the voting booths this November, then there go all the turnout models and all the rest of it, uh, and it will be a very uh, different kind of election. But D Donald, Donald Trump is just basically, in, in many ways, is Bernie Sanders with a billion dollars and more distinctive hair. They're, uh, <laughs> they're, they're, the, the, the white, uh, blue-collar uh, mass vote in, in rural New England looks at these guys and say, wow, this is, this is bizarre. For the first time, they, they actually seem to be talking to me. Uh, and that's why we had spectacular turnout in New So, so uh, we, we've got to wrap up, mm. but um, are you starting to believe that Trump could become president? And what would it be like if he did? I think, I think Trump will be, uh, most likely be the nominee. And uh, if he's running against Bernie, uh, I don't know, Lenore may get her wish and we'll have the first socialist president of the United States. We're in wholly <laughs> uncharted... <laughs> Whoa, no! <laughs> That's not an applause line! <laughs> I give up, Tony. <laughs> it was a laugh line, though. No, no, no. Um, I got the taxi to the airport after that. That's like... <laughs> Well, it wasn't the entire audience. There's a cross-section of people here. But that is all we have time for tonight. Please thank our panel, Lenore Taylor, Steve Chobo, Terry Butler, Mark Stein and Sarah Hanson-Young. Thank you very much. Now, next Monday...
Next Monday on Q&A, we'll turn our attention to international affairs and the challenge of terrorism with the Minister for Justice and Counterterrorism, Michael Keenan, the Shadow Minister for Foreign Affairs and Deputy Labor Leader, Tanya Plibersek, counter-insurgency expert and strategic advisor to the US and the Australian military, David Kilcullen, leading Israeli journalist and foreign correspondent, Eldad Beck, and Dr Rainan Ishmael from the Centre for Arab and Islamic Studies at ANU. Until next week's Q&A, good night. Thank you.